In the modern world, when we want to make something happen automatically, we use these newfangled computer things. Whether that means a huge industrial automation system controlling robots in a factory, or an Arduino you learned how to program to do whatever the kids do with Arduinos these days, our modern world is based on bits of silicon executing instructions. It's a pretty great place to be. For now. But to me, it's not all that interesting. What is much more interesting to me is the wild world of electromechanical wonders that is pretty much all general purpose automation from 1975-ish and before. Electromechanics is my favorite kind of automation. Why? Because using nothing but switches, some motors, some relays, maybe a solenoid or two, and a heck of a lot of ingenuity, you can make surprisingly complex things happen all without a single bit of code. For example, a jukebox. This here is the Statesman by Wurlitzer. This beautifully brown beast hails from the year 1970. I mean, of course it does. This may be the ugliest jukebox ever produced. It's, even as an outspoken fan of the color brown, this is not very attractive. But at least with the lights on, we get some purple. Also known as the 3400 series, this jukebox introduced the new Wurlamatic record changer mechanism which sadly was a radical departure from Wurlitzer's previous designs which put the mechanism on full display. Here it's hidden, but luckily I have the key to open it up. Now what this mechanism does is fairly obvious upon a short glance. I mean, it's got a carousel of records, an arm to grab hold of one of them and place it on this little turntable, and so obviously the carousel will rotate to a specific record, stop, the arm will grab it, put it on the turntable with the selected side facing up, let go of it, then the tone arm will move into position to play it, and once it's done the tone arm will return to its resting position, the record grabby arm will grab it again, put it back, and we're done. So let's see how that works in action. I'll be selecting M3, which will play the A side of the green record. Pay attention to the sounds it makes. Alright, and now that the record is over, watch what happens. You might think that the carousel will stop once it gets back to its starting position, but it actually continues for one more rotation. Then it comes to a halt. Now you might ask, how does it know what record to play? What was the point of that sound before the carousel started to move? And more generally, what are the brains of this operation? If there isn't a microcontroller controlling things all micro-like, how can it be controlled? The answer is a whole bunch of weird, purpose-built mechanisms, rat's nests of wires, and a staggering number of switches. That's it. Electromechanics are really quite simple as a concept, but the applications can be a little complex, at least on the surface. Before we get too far into the electro side of things, Let's look at the mechanics more closely. The heart of the Wurlamatic mechanism is right here. This controls everything the jukebox does aside from record selection, and all of its functions are performed by a simple electric motor and gear reduction drive. Here I've rewired the motor to a constant power source. You'll notice that it simply repeats the same actions over and over again. Grab the record, put it down, move the tone arm, then the same thing in reverse. It's just a constant back and forth. But notice how much it's actually doing. It may look like it's just moving the arm back and forth, but it's a lot more than that. Most of everything that's happening is happening because of this one very complex mechanism. The mechanism is powered by the main cam motor underneath it. And as the mechanism rotates, so do a series of cams. A cam is a sort of oddly shaped wheel that rotates around a shaft and thanks to its odd shape, it translates rotational movement into linear movement with the help of a cam follower, which gets pushed as the cam rubs against it. In fact, built into the drive gear is a vaguely heart-shaped groove which serves as the cam that operates the record arm. 
It's a little hard to see, but there's a little peg riding in this groove, and it causes the record arm to pivot backwards away from the record carousel, with the help of this little ratchet and gear thing. At its pivot point, these three gears serve as the means by which each side of the record is selected. Pins on the two side gears will stop either one of them from turning when they hit these catches. This then causes the arm to rotate sideways as it continues to pivot backwards. Depending on which pin is stopped, it will rotate in either one direction or the other, and this solenoid moves the catch points back and forth, therefore its position determines which side is played. In its resting state, it will rotate to play side B by default, and when this solenoid is energized, it catches the other pin to play side A. Obviously, the most noticeable thing this mechanism does is move the record takeout arm, which is its official name, by the way. But thanks to a series of other cams adjacent to the main drive gear and the various linkages they attach to, it does much more too. The single cam in front of the main drive gear releases the record from the record arm by way of this linkage, which also pulls the turntable slightly to the left so the record can spin freely of the arm. Two of the cams behind the drive gear move the tone arm to play the record, with one responsible for lifting it up and the other for moving it left and right. And there's even a cam just for activating this little button which switches the amplifier from its auxiliary input to the phonograph input when a record is being played. Take a look at this exploded diagram. This is everything going on inside the Wurlamatic mechanism. There are seven cams in total, though that's not perfectly true, as you'll see later, but anyway, these seven cams are the programming of the physical actions that take place. Their shape and position dictate at what points in the mechanism's 360-degree rotation each action will occur. This may not look like a program, but it very much is. Note that the cams could be made to cause one action to happen multiple times per cycle, if required. However, this clever mechanical program doesn't make for a useful jukebox all by itself. If it just runs all the time, well, then that wouldn't do anything but make a bizarre record-flinging dance. We need a way to control when the program starts. Of course, we also need to pause the program in the middle when the arm has reached the turntable so the record can actually play, and then we'll need to restart the program to put the record back. Of course, finally, there needs to be a way to shut down that program altogether once that task is complete. So we need some sort of additional control. Of course, before I rewired the motor, it didn't start moving until the correct record was in place, and it was automatically stopping in both the record playback and its resting positions. How did it do that? Well, what makes it automatic is the plethora of micro switches you see all over the place that function as interlocks, interrupts, start-stop points, and triggers for other ancillary actions. Okay, so here's something that's super common in electromechanics and is going to come up a few times here. Self-latching circuits with interrupts. Using a relay, we can design a circuit that will latch itself in a closed state until another action occurs. What is a relay? Well, a relay is an electrically operated switch. A small electromagnet within the relay opens or closes any number of switch contacts. One of the most common things we do with relays is control high power devices with low voltage, low current control circuitry. But we can also be almost endlessly clever with them. So let's say we want to turn on this light bulb with a momentary push button switch. We could wire the bulb right to the push button, but of course that means it's only lit so long as the button is held in. And it also means the button has to handle all of that current. What I want is for the button to turn the light bulb on and for it to stay on after the button is released. Here's a simple circuit which will accomplish that by latching itself closed. 12 volts DC power is used here on the control side of the relay, but the load side of the relay can be whatever we want it to be. This relay is now the switch which turns the light bulb on, and it will do so whenever the relay receives 12 volts DC power. So we've got a 12 volt supply and a ground for the relay with the bulb wired on a completely separate 120 volt circuit through one of the normally open contacts of the relay. If I wire the 12 volt supply through the push button, now the relay will energize whenever the button is depressed, which closes the switch contacts inside the relay and turns on the light. This also has the benefit of making the button's electrical connections safe to touch, since they're now just handling 12 volts. But the light still goes out as soon as you release the button because the relay loses its 12 volt power source. 
However, if I branch off the 12 volt supply to another of the normally open switch contacts of the relay, then feed the other side of that back into the control side input, what now happens is that as soon as I push the button, the 12 volt control side becomes self powered. The button is now completely out of the picture as it becomes bypassed by the relay itself. The relay is now stuck in the closed position or latched forever, at least until the power supply is cut. Taking a closer look, we now have a second power source coming from before the switch. This has 12 volts on it at all times. Again, it's going to the second set of switch contacts of the relay, and its output is being fed back to the control side. If there's no power from the button, well, nothing happens. But as soon as the button supplies power, that second wire snaps into action, bypassing the button and keeping the relay energized. But if I cut that second wire feeding the relay and put a second button across it, this one with normally closed contacts, that means I can interrupt the 12 volt supply that's keeping the relay energized in order to deactivate it. Now I press the on button, which energizes the relay. This of course turns on the light bulb, but also creates that new 12 volt supply for the relay to stay on indefinitely. But that new supply now travels through this second button. When I press it, it momentarily breaks the 12 volt supply to the relay, which de-energizes it, and the light goes out. However, as soon as the green button supplies 12 volts again, even for just a tiny fraction of a second, the relay provides a bypass for itself once more, and the light stays on. Pretty clever, huh? There are all sorts of applications for a circuit like this. For example, a garage door opener. Push one button, the motor starts, and it doesn't stop until a limit switch at the end of the door's travel opens the circuit. Of course, you'll also want to design in some safety interlocks and other stuff, but hey, it would work. It might also kill someone, but it would work. So then, how does this apply to the jukebox? Well, the Whirlomatic has a micro switch that serves as an interrupt to a latched relay. It's the red button in our previous example. It rides along the edge of the main gear. That's why I said there are more than seven cams, because this is also its own kind of cam. Once the program is started, it will continue to run on its own because a relay, specifically the main cam relay, is latched in. But it's latched through this, the transfer switch. Now, you'll notice that the switch doesn't actually get actuated. <laughs> Now, you'll notice that the switch doesn't actually get actuated until the main cam has moved a little bit. Why is that? Well, because at first, either the side one or side two relay serves as the power source for the main cam relay. Electromechanics can get a little complicated. The same device can receive power from multiple places, but so long as you sequence things correctly, you can manage it. When the carousel has reached the correct selection, either the side 1 or side 2 relay will be activated. That starts the main cam program, just like pushing the green button. However, the signal from the first relay will disappear shortly after the record arm has moved from its resting position. We'll get into the specifics of why that happens when we get to the delightfully named selection accumulator. To put it more simply, a signal caused this motor to start turning, just like the green button turned on the relay. But to keep it turning, we need to generate a new signal because we're going to lose the first one, just like releasing the green button. And that's what this switch does. The transfer switch keeps the main cam relay energized, and thus the main cam motor running, all the way through its rotation until the record is put back, at which point it is released. But wait, that's a problem. Doesn't it need to stop midway through to actually play the record? Indeed, it does. So, there is another switch at play here, appropriately called the play switch. This is actually a sort of second red button in this scenario, but it's not going to totally kill the circuit. Instead, it will just sort of pause it. Ironic for a switch named play. Whenever the transfer switch is engaged, the main cam relay is too, so it wants to move the mechanism. But once the play switch is activated by this cam, 
It interrupts the flow of power from the transfer switch and de-energizes the main cam relay. This then causes the entire Wurlamatic mechanism to stop. And now the record can play. Incidentally, this switch does double duty as the same switch which mutes the amplifier's auxiliary input to give priority to whatever record is playing. The key difference here is that the transfer switch is still trying to send power to the main cam relay, but it's being interrupted by the play switch. So what happens when the record is over? If this circuit was designed like our red and green button thingy, well, if the red button's being held in, we would need another green button to provide power and start it back up. Do we have one? Well, yes, that's the trip switch located right here. It's activated by the tone arm once it's near to the runout groove of the record. This then bypasses the play switch, allowing current to go around it and thus re-energize the main cam relay to restart the program. Now here's a bit of nuance which is very neat and I want to highlight it. The trip switch works as a bypass for the play switch, right? Which again, the play switch stops everything so the record can play. The play switch isn't letting power through to the main cam relay, but the trip switch provides a workaround. But that means that the programming of all these cams needs to be done such that the play switch gets released before the tone arm is pulled back to its resting position. Otherwise, the play switch would just cause things to come to a halt once more as soon as the tone arm moved away from the trip switch. You can see that things were programmed just perfectly so that the play switch gets released then the tone arm moves. This is why electromechanics are so fascinating to me. It's a delicate ballet of logical circuit design and physical interactions. You need to make this action stop? Well, just make it hit a switch that kills it. Oh, you need to start it up again? Well, just add another switch that undoes the first one. And make sure you get the timing right, or it won't work at all. Basically, there are a ton of if-then statements in here, but manifested as wires and switches. It's a form of logic, but very rudimentary. When you combine that with crazy mechanisms like the Wurlamatic, you find yourself with a machine that can do surprisingly complex things all through what's its and doodads. None of that their computery business. And you'll also find some important safety interlocks too. For example, notice how when the record grabby thing grabs the record from the carousel, it ends up between the two records surrounding the one it's grabbing. Well, what if the record carousel were to move with it in that position? A bunch of records would be broken by the little hook. To keep that from happening, the motor which turns the carousel is wired through this micro switch, which is only depressed when the Wurlamatic mechanism has opened the jaw of the… right, the takeout arm, that's what it's called. This prevents what we in the business call a bad day. And of course, you'll find some other switches here that do other groovy things, like the side 2 release switch. This is what actually releases the side 2 relay. There's another one, of course, for the side 1 relay, and these function just like the red buttons in our little demo rig. Both the side 1 and 2 relays are self-latching to get the main cam relay, and thus the entire mechanism, going. And these two switches are responsible for releasing them. You'll notice that it's the same pins which are used to turn the takeout arm that actually actuate these two switches. But of course, we haven't answered perhaps the most important question about this machine. What gets this all started? How does it know to start turning the carousel? And how does the carousel know what record to stop at? Or what side to play? Well, I'm going to save that for the next video. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm sorry, but this is already what? 19 minutes long or thereabouts. But before I go, let's look at one more thing. I bet you didn't think you could just remove the record carousel, but you can. It's actually just sitting in here. Just select a record to be played, then shut it off. Now the carousel can simply be lifted up and out. Look at what's underneath. It's connected to this black arm which can be spun around. This is clearly going to some sort of mechanism below it. That mechanism is the readout arm, and it, along with the selection accumulator, are perhaps the most amazing parts of this entire machine. The selection accumulator is what made the sound you heard before everything got started. This one. Notice when I select a record that the buttons stay depressed until that sound stops. Then they pop back out. That's actually the reason there's a reset button in the middle, so that way if you press the wrong button you can pop it out. 
Now, listen closely as I select a series of records. A1, C1, E1, G1, and J1. Did you notice something changing with each selection? What's going on? Well, stay tuned because in the next video, we'll find out. Thanks for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video and that my explanations were easy enough to follow. Electromechanics are really quite simple, but they can be a little confusing. When you use switches and relays to make sequences and interlocks, it can seem to get out of hand. In fact, these here are the schematics for this machine. They're super easy to read. You might have thought this was a pretty simple device with what you've seen up till now, but trust me, when we explain where these buttons go, it's gonna get a lot more complicated. I think I'll play some music now. How about T1? liked that delivery so much and then it fell apart. And a staggering number of switches re- oh. <laughs> that's, the, that's the end of the sentence. <laughs> Oops. Did I say of course weirdly? It's a little late now because I'm already moving it back, but I think I did. However, this clever mechanical program wouldn't make for a useful jukebox. It's later than you think it is. I'm kind of tired. When I press it, it Mormon- Those are fun words. They aren't words, they're just sounds. So what happens when the record is over? Oh, it's not a, it's not phrased as a question that I know the answer to. I should have added a paragraph here. I need to, I need to say something that's not in the script. That'll go well.